Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us today. Before we begin, I would like to advise those participating that we will be recording today's session. Good afternoon all on behalf of Eastern Melbourne PHN. I wish to welcome everyone to the Health Assessment in General Practice webinar. My name is Nicole Stark and I'm the Events and Education Coordinator here at EMFM. Uh, before we begin, I would like to start with an, uh, an acknowledgement of country. Eastern Melbourne PHN acknowledges the Wurundjeri people and other people of the Kulin nations on whose unceded land our work in the community takes place. Emfin respectfully acknowledges their ancestors and elders past and present. In the spirit of reconciliation, Eastern Melbourne PHN acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their cultural, environmental and spiritual connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. We recognise and value the knowledge and wisdom of people with lived experience, their supporters and the practitioners who work with them and celebrate their strength and resilience in facing the challenges associated with recovery. We acknowledge the important contribution that they make to the development and delivery of health and community services in our catchment. Some quick housekeeping, all attendees will remain on mute throughout the presentation. Please type any questions for our speaker in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and these will be answered at the end of the presentation. We thank you all in joining us for this valuable information session. This engaging event aims to enhance your understanding of health assessments in primary healthcare, expand your knowledge and improve your practice. I'd now like to introduce our fabulous speaker. In 2014, Jane founded CDM Plus to improve chronic disease care. She's an experienced nurse with diverse roles in acute care, community, occupational and corporate health. She later specialised in primary health care as a chronic disease nurse, holding qualifications in chronic disease management and health coaching. Her experience in clinical software funding and process development has made CDM Plus a leader in the field. And on that note, I would like to pass the metaphorical mic to Jane. Thanks, Nicole. Just going to share my screen. Okay, so we should all be yep. seeing the right screen. Good. <laughs> um, so welcome to this wonderful session we've got set up for today. Um, CDM Plus, uh, as Nicole said, we're looking at chronic disease management training and resources. So part of that training is always health assessments. So health assessments and care plans um, are those main activities that we're usually looking at. So the learning objectives there, we've got to identify the different types of health assessments. Believe it or not, we've got 11 different types of health assessments. So hoping to break that down a little bit um, today to differentiate between the different Medicare items because that can be a little bit confusing as well. And then we'd like to touch on some of the screening tools. So um, I do have the software open and I'm hoping to, at the end of the slides, just get into best practice, just as an example, and just show you um, the health assessment component there of how to put one together if you haven't done that before. So our main health assessments that we're gonna cover in the session are those 11 that I spoke about. Um, so I'll break those down in the three different sections in a minute. So I know it can be overwhelming when you just look at this big list of the different types of health assessments and not quite sure where to start. And for me, it always feels like I'm doing this. You know, we're buried in a lot of other tasks at the clinic as well. It's not usually just focusing on one um, activity like a health assessment. So it's usually a bit of treatment room and the, the chronic disease management. So how can we balance that? How can we look at that from a clinic um, point of view to actually just cater to the patients that we have in our um, actual, actual practice population? So we'll start with the little breakdown. I've got a couple of top tips there um, that you can have a look back on after the session as well. But for me, it comes down to a lot of planning. So the first top tip that I've got there is to actually plan. And I know that the PHN did a, a quality improvement activity that they'll kind of refer back to at the end of the session as well, but I'm a big fan of data. So 
looking at your patient population, we can actually break down our demographics and figure out which health assessment or what types of um, health assessments that we're actually going to focus on and when. So we kind of reverse engineer that process if we can a little bit. There are three main types of health assessments. So we've got the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health assessments. Uh, there's the time-based assessments and then the heart health assessments. So we've actually got the links to the um, Medicare uh, information just in the background if you want to be able to have a look at those. Um, so that will just take you straight through. But I'm actually going to go over across to our flow chart to help just explain that breakdown and how to decide which health assessment to do. So our main little flow chart that we've got, the reason we put this together was that it actually became so confusing um, to actually try and figure out where to start um, and what to bill as a day-to-day a -day, um, item number. So I guess for me, it's always going to come down to um, where they fall, what's the reimbursement like for the clinic. So obviously we want to make sure that we're getting that maximum um, item number if we can. So for me, it starts with that first dot point. So we've got, does the patient identify as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander? If the answer is yes, then we're always going to complete the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health check under that 715 item number. The only exception, which I'm not going to get into too much detail, is if the patient is um, identifying as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and is living in a aged care home, and then it would come under the time base. But for our purposes in primary care um, and general practice, this will be under the 715 item number. Now, the reason we want to, uh, I guess, build this um, particular item number if the patient does identify is it actually gives us access to the five individual allied health visits plus the actual follow-up numbers, the 10987, and we get 10 of those per calendar year. So it just allows us to continue on from that health assessment and follow up anything that we need to um, and getting reimbursed for the time to do that. So if the patient doesn't identify as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, we've really got the two other options to look at. So we've got the time-based health assessments that you can see in that second section, and that's under those time-based numbers that you can see in the Navy there. Um, most clinics, when they see this list, they go, oh my God, I'm not actually doing any more than just like the, the top one or the top two. Um, a lot of clinics will, depending on the demographic, sometimes just be looking at the over 75 um, over 75 year old health check and sometimes that's it and especially since COVID um, before COVID a lot of clinics were maybe doing quite a few more but obviously since COVID and down to resources and what's available it's sometimes a bit trickier to get back on track with where we were um, maybe doing those before so um, we're going to look at some of the screening tools, especially to do with that 40 to 49 and 45 to 49 health check, because that's when our patients are, I guess, at the highest risk of getting a chronic condition. So we will have to look at those um, in that next little bit. Uh, so we've also got the residential aged care facilities. So for those uh, practices that are actually servicing the aged care homes, uh, patients with intellectual disability, the former members of the ADF, and the refugees or humanitarian entrants. So um, there's so many to kind of pick from, and I think that's where you'll kind of go back to your data and you can quickly see, you know, we can search by ethnicity, we can, you know, run a search and look at our data based on age groups as well. So it's going to come down to maybe just picking that target group and just starting there. I think just starting is, I guess, the, the first step. Um, so if the patient's not eligible for a time-based assessment, uh, we can actually see if they meet that criteria for the heart health check. Now, a lot of um, there's a lot of discussion about this in clinics, and um, sometimes they'll say the reimbursement for that particular item number is, you know, not as high as they'd like, and you know maybe it's not a really good um, item to focus on and things like that. But um, for myself, especially when you can see in that second little component with the time base, uh, we can't actually do these assessments all the time. It's a you know, for the 49, 40 to 49 OS risk um, for patients at risk of diabetes, it's only a once in three years. So it's not really something we can do every 12 months with a patient. So for me, I like to look at it in that picture where I want patients to get used to coming to the clinic for their preventative health care every 12 months. 
So I kind of try and picture it as maybe we just, for patients that don't identify, try and go back and forth between the heart health check and time base, depending on obviously what the patient's eligible for. So that way we can actually offer a health assessment every 12 months. So uh, I guess it's it's up to the clinic to decide that workflow. But um, for me, it we've, we've kind of put this together in the way that's obviously best for the patient, like offering um, additional support like the 715 does with Allied Health and, and Nurse Follow-Up. Um, and then the other way is the financial viability of the practice as well, looking at the time-based assessment first before the heart health check. So let's have a closer look. We're going to have a look at the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health checks. And same thing, I've got the links to each of those different age groups so you can go back and have a, a bit of a closer look. Um, and I'll bring up the descriptions of these in our um, manual so we can have a bit of a closer look as well. But basically three separate age groups, we've got the 0 to 14, 15 to 54 and over 55. Um, so I'm actually just going to share my screen to bring up the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health check. So you can see here on the 0 to 14, I guess for me when I'm looking at this particular age group, there's a couple of things that we can actually look at. So the clinics that do have high numbers of um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander patients, um, in a lot of the Aboriginal medical services that we've um, kind of previously well, I've previously worked in as a nurse, we actually used to line up the first 715 um, for the kids in this age group because we can do this from age zero. So we would actually line up the first uh, 715 with the six-week immunisations. So because the 715s, we can do those every nine months, the second 715 lines up quite nicely then with the 12-month immunisations. Um, so you can see there's a lot um, there for us to kind of um, go through in that 715 as well. So if it is something you think about combining appointments, try and think about how we're going to actually, I guess, target that um, appointment book. Do we need to allocate extra time and things for that to occur? Um, and then the next little age group that we've got, well, I guess the one other thing, uh, I guess, the organising of other um, referrals and things. So early interventions, you know, it might be paediatrician, it might be other um, specialties that we need to organise as part of that um, particular health assessment as well. So it's just down to patient by patient for that. The adult 715 is our age group where it's the 15 to 54. Um, and this one is very similar. So try not to get caught up in the different, I guess, names of the health assessments. And um, I try and just group these together. So the adult 715, um, the 40 to 49 at risk of diabetes, the 45 to 49 at risk of chronic conditions and the heart health assessment. For me, they're very, very similar health assessments because they're actually um, getting us to look and identify um, patients' risk factors for actually getting chronic conditions. Um, and we're going to try and look at those risk factors and hopefully modify um, those if we can and look at some of the lifestyle modifications. So it's all about identifying risk, I guess, is what I'm trying to say when it comes to the different health checks. So especially in that adult age group. So for this one in particular, you can see they're particularly asking for a whole heap of extra um, examination to be done. So we'll speak about this when we look at which observations to record during a health check as well. Um, and then you can see all the other tests that may need to be organised depending on the patient's age, et cetera. Um, but you can see it overlaps. So current health problems and risk factors. So we're always going to be looking at that regardless of the health check. Um, and then you can see any other tests that need to be followed up, any examinations. Now, for the older person's assessment, the 55 plus, if anyone's ever done the over 75 health check, you'll actually notice that these descriptions are exactly exactly the same. So um, for me, this is all about what services are in place and what else needs to be maybe put in place um, to help these patients and consumers stay at home a little bit longer. So same thing, we're doing a lot of assessments, a lot of screening. 
um, as part of this follow-up and usually for this one and the over 75 you usually have a lot of paperwork or follow-up appointments with things like you know a, a lot of clinics sometimes organize um, this one the over 75 with the driver's medicals etc if they need to so um, usually there's a lot of follow-up appointment but there's also a lot of services that can be tied in um, for uh, the patient and so just recognizing what's available in your state and then nationally. So an example might be uh, with continents, there's the continents um, program for uh, for apps um, to actually get some funding to help support um, clients that might need to get um, additional products. So just recognizing some of the services that may be available after. So if we have a look at the time base then, You can see I've got the seven in that group there. Um, I just actually want to look at let me go back into the slide to just look at the times in a second as well. So the time-based assessments, the seven different assessments, the, the GP will actually choose which item they wish to bill. Uh, for those that have been around for a long time, um, we used to, used to be the only health assessment that actually counts the nurse or health worker time with the GP. Um, and so for anyone that was around back when these numbers first uh, came out, we would just usually kind of add up, there were 30 minutes with Jane, there were, you know, 30 minutes for the GP, and then we'd pick the appropriate time. So I just want to flag that and the bits that I've underlined in there um, to just have a look at. So if you haven't had a look at these in a little while, um, they did actually update the descriptions a little while ago. So it was um, the 701, if we look at that one first, so that's the brief health assessment and it's a simple health assessment, um, no more than 30 minutes. The 703, um, they is straightforward. They do not present with complex health issues. Um, that's the 30 to 45. The 705, a range of health issues for an extensive assessment at 45 minutes to 60. And then the 707 is complex and it's significant long-term health needs. So I think for me, it's not so much about the time as in it is about the complexity of that particular assessment. So if you haven't had a look at those descriptions um, in a little bit, it's probably worth having that as a discussion at the practice level um, to see if any changes or you need to look at things um, around the, the billing cycles of these health assessments. So there's seven different types of the health assessments. Um, as I said before, the first three health assessments are probably the most common. So when we talk about health assessments with clinics, most clinics will say, yes, we're definitely doing the over 75 health check. Um, and then the other first two, the 40 to 49 and 45 to 49 um, is probably the other most common one that clinics will be doing. So it's just going to come down to your practice population and which patients, um, I guess, fall into those categories. So what I might actually do, I'm going to go in and have a look at the 40 to 49 um, description, and then we're going to look at one of the screening tools um, that we would use as part of that. And then we'll look at the other description for the 45 to 49 as well. So the 40 to 49 health check, um, for those clinics that may be doing these, um, I think it's a really good assessment. I think we should maybe start doing this a little bit earlier um, if that's possible as well. Obviously the heart health check gives us the ability to flag other chronic conditions as well as the um, cardiovascular disease as well. So for me, it's just an opportunity to talk about prevention and early detection with the patient. So the 40 to 49, a couple of things that we need to do, I guess the aim is to review the risk factors um, and that high score around type two. Uh, they've got specifically what they want to include um, in that health assessment. So you can see a lot of it's going to come back to the lifestyle risk factors and then other risk factors. Um, so that's very similar to that description that we just looked at in the um, 715 adult health assessment. And then in particular, we actually have to do 
the OSRI score before we do this one. Um, so this is something where when we do training, sometimes there's um, nurses or clinics that might not be using the OSRI score, might not have seen it before. And then there's other clinics that are actively using it as part of their um, chronic disease management activities like the health assessments and care plans. So um, I want to show you a couple of options of using the OSRIS and just talk about my, my own preferences with those as well. Obviously, everyone's going to have their, their preferences with how they want to use these. So I'll show you mine. So I will have these links at the end as part of the presentation that you'll get a copy of as well. Um, but for me, the OSRIS tool, you can access a couple of different ways. So the um, Department of Health has got a couple of options. They've got an interactive version um, online, but non-interactive. My preference after all these years is still the PDF version. Um, and it's more because I found that this is the one that probably engages uh, the consumers the most. So uh, when we look at that, so some of you may recognize this little um, pamphlet that's available. What I like about it is we can actually order it into the clinic for free. So it doesn't cost the clinic anything. Um, so some clinics might have these displayed out in their waiting room. Other examples are that um, some clinics might have this attached to their new patient form or uh, one clinic was telling me that they use this as a um, type of a birthday card and they were sending it out all to their 39-year-old patients that were just turning 40. And on the inside, on the outside, it said, you know, happy birthday. On the inside, it had the Oz risk uh, questions in there. So saying, you know, you might be eligible for a free health check, fill this out and come back to another clinic. Um, so I'm just going to open that up and just have a quick look to have a look through here. So for those that haven't seen this screening tool before, I like this one on the one page just because everything's there that we need to talk about with the patient. So if I scroll right down to the bottom, it's actually got the, the scoring and what it means. So I know that we know that the patient's at risk sometimes. I know the GP knows that the patient's at risk, but sometimes we need to explain that a little bit better. Um, to the patient, give them that opportunity to identify that risk with them um, and then talk about things that we can do to modify that risk. So for this particular health assessment, the 40 to 49, um, the patient needs to have a score of 12 or more. Okay. So when I'm using this with a patient, I would usually start with the form and I'll just say, look, um, we're going to have a look at this little screening tool. It's going to tell us your risk of getting type 2 diabetes in the next five years. Um, for that to be a high risk, it's anything above 12. So the reason I like to start with the scoring is I think it actually does explain it that little bit better and they're actually counting the numbers as you're going through the questions then. So from there, we're just going to go straight down um, and start. So we've got the non-modifiable risk factors, which we'll have a look at separately in a sec. Um, so we've got the age. So you can see even as soon as you hit... 35, you start getting points. So technically, this is the most depressing screening tool you could ever do um, for yourself or with a patient. But you can see from, um, say we had a patient that was a male in their 40s, um, they're either two and three or four and three, which is seven. So they're either five or seven and we're two questions into the actual questionnaire. So by the time we actually get through to things like ethnicity, country of birth, family history, if they've ever had a high reading before, if they're taking blood pressure medication, um, smoking, you can see we're dropping into the lifestyle, not eating fruit and veg every day, not being active, and then the weight waist um, measurement as well. So by the time we get to the point where we're adding up the points, like sometimes patients are like, oh my God, I can't believe it was that much or um, things like that. So once we've added it up, I normally just grab a highlighter and highlight wherever we're sitting. And then we can actually talk about that um, with them. So I prefer to kind of work this into whenever we can. So for those that have ever done training with us before, like with care plans um, and reviews in particular, like if we, we have that opportunity to bring any of the screening tools in as part of that prevention and early detection, we're going to look at their risk factors and add that to our to-do list for that next 12 months. So I do like this one as the hard copy. For those using uh, your clinical software, I do like using the clinical software, obviously, to keep our data and things up to date. So even if I do have access to something like best practice where we've got the OSRISC uh, screening tool in there, 
I'm still going to use the hard copy so the patient can then take that one home because that one gives us an opportunity to discuss with the patient about how we can actually reduce it. So I would actually highlight on there and just say, well, if we could get that down, you know, or if we could get you to exercise a little bit more, we could actually get a couple of points back there, et cetera. So I, I still like that combination, but everyone's going to have their preference. So I'll have the links there and you can have a look to see um, which one you'd actually like to use with your patients. But I do believe this is a really good health assessment for us to start targeting. Um, a lot of clinics will actually just usually go straight back to um, the 45 to 49 because that's a really easy search to do um, on your software or your secondary software if you're using something like PEN or um, Polar, et cetera, like to actually find uh, your demographics, even just in your software, you can search by that age. So some clinics will just start with that 45 to 49 and keep going with that over 75. The reason I'm really keen to start at this 40 to 49 group is we want to get to patients earlier because if they're high risk in 40, um, we really need to be getting on top of that then because if that's their high risk score at 40, by 45, we're probably going to be diagnosing them with diabetes and then a couple other conditions on top of that. Um, so the other description I just want to have a quick look at is that 45 to 49 at risk of developing a chronic disease. So in the manual, let's just say our next little one of all. So the 45 to 49, you can see it's very similar to the previous description for the 40 to 49 and the same as the average and Torres Strait Islander adult health assessment. Again, we're talking about risk factors. Again, we're talking about lifestyle and family history. So for me, this ticks a lot of patients that we're probably seeing coming in uh, to the clinics for other reasons, and it might be just through the treatment room. So I think being aware of some of these age groups and some of these adult-based um, assessments that we can do, whether it was the time-based or the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander or heart health check, you're never going to have the patient more engaged than when they're with you at the clinic. So I think even as treatment room, if that's how you kind of split your treatment room and CDM roles, um, it's that opportunity even in the treatment room for us to flag something and say, oh, actually, I think you're at... Um, you're eligible for one of our free health checks, let's get you back and um, book back in if that's something that they wanted to do. So I think they're more likely to book, they're more likely to actually turn up if they book it on the day. Um, so yeah, it's just something to have a little think about how you want to target the different patients that meet that criteria. Um, so 45 to 49, the 40 to 49, the over 75 I'll just kind of go straight into that one just to show you the difference in there as well. So you can see that that description is exactly the same as the over 55 for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. Um, this one's every 12 months. The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health checks are every nine months. And some clinics still keep that nine-month assessment to the 10 or 12 months, but I try and keep it right on that nine months if we can. Uh, so for those clinics that are servicing the residential aged care homes, there are other assessments. So we've got the comprehensive medical assessment uh, that's on admission and then every 12 months. The patients that have uh, intellectual disability is also one of the other ones. This is a really comprehensive assessment for those that may or may not have um, heard or seen um, anyone in the clinic like some of the other GPs, et cetera, like doing these assessments. Um, you do need a lot of time, especially depending on state. Like um, ours in New South Wales, the, the chat tool is actually still paper-based. So um, it, it is a bit of double documenting to kind of get the paperwork done. So there is quite a lot in here and usually a lot of follow-up and, and tests that need to be ordered as well. But that's a once every 12 months as well. Um, and you can literally filter by condition and try and see which patients kind of meet that criteria as well. We've got the um, refugee and humanitarian entrance. This is a once only health check. Um, so this is something to just think about um, whether any of your kind of patients might meet that particular criteria. Um, in all the clinics that I've worked with over the years, I, there wasn't really many that I've done. I think I've only done two, one at one clinic and one at another clinic. But there's clinics in some areas like Brisbane, as an example, that really have high um, numbers of um, humanitarian refugee entrants. So they're doing quite a few. 
it's something to be done within that 12 months of arrival as well. So it's just based on the um, different visa categories. And then the last one we're just going to look at will be the ADF post-discharge. Uh, now, this one is a uh, once only, but I'm not going to get into the CVC DVA side of things. I've got the links there for the other um, health assessments in our little quick reference um, slide that you can go back and have a look at if you are looking at any of your DVA um, clients. So you can actually have a look at that in the background. Same thing, um, depending on the software you're using, Best Practice and Medical Director both have a um, kind of a wizard in Medical Director. In Best Practice, you have it there in the EPC section, which is really good. So I'm just going to show you the one in BP today if you haven't seen it. So under that Enhanced Primary Care little bundle, you can see we've got the ADF post-discharge. This is a really good one, even if you don't have many clients that will kind of um, meet the criteria for this one, it's actually good to just have a quick run through. The first time I ever had to do one, I kind of wasn't prepared, had to you know, run through the questions. So there's a whole section there on the ADF history. So just making yourself familiar with some of the questions that you may have to kind of go through as part of that assessment. There's a really big section on mental health. Um, so for those nurses or um, health workers that might not be as confident doing some of the screening tools like K10, et cetera, it's probably good to have a little um, look at these in the background. Uh, and then this is the only assessment, I guess, where <clears throat> it actually flags sub substance use. Um, so if you do have text shortcuts and progress notes set up in the um, other components of your software, you may want to think about adding substance use with a little text shortcut so you've got like a little prompt of what you might be asking for, just so it's consistent um, with the clinic as well and what everyone is doing. There's the quick reference guide and the guidelines for the GPs as well. And then we've got some links for some of that other information um, in the references you can go back to. And then the last health assessment that we're just going to have a little look at will be the heart health check. So it's the 699, it's the professional attendance um, for anyone 30 or over that has had a heart health check. Um, so it's specifically looking at the risk for cardiovascular disease. But for me, as I said, I look at it as an opportunity to get the patient involved with their health. So if we're calling it a heart health assessment, I think it's a really good time to actually um, look at the risk factors for other chronic conditions. So for those that have done our advanced CDM um, training, like the workshop, you'll notice that a lot of those risk factors um, actually overlap. So when we look at those non-modifiable risk factors in a second, you'll see that a lot of those overlap with things like um, diabetes. So if someone's at risk for cardiovascular, they're definitely going to be at risk for something like diabetes as well. So I think it's a great time to just put a list together of the things that they're at risk and potential screening tools or other um, tests that we might need to do after that health assessment. So we've put together just a quick little summary of those main health assessment numbers just so you can click through and have a look as I said the annual veterans health check that's now available is down in that section for you to have a look at um, if you do have patients that meet that criteria um, and we've got the OMP numbers there as well for anyone that has the non-VR GPs working with them as well um, the other one that I've just attached in the slide is just the allied health pathway after a health assessment so um, this is how patients can access allied health. And the one after a health assessment is that middle one. So it's just for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander patients that have had a health assessment. Um, and it's five under the individual allied health visits per calendar year. So it's a great um, opportunity, I think, especially if we're looking at lifestyle modifications for patients that may have had a 715 but not necessarily have a chronic condition yet. It's a great way for us to involve allied health if we need to. So I guess... A lot of the questions around health assessments, because there are so many um, different assessments, is, you know, what do we do with our appointment types? You know, how long do those appointments need to be? How long do they need to be with a nurse or health worker? How long with the GP? So the next little top tip that we've just put there is to just actually um, define your process. So how long do you want those appointments to be? You know, what does that workflow actually look like? How are we going to get the patients into the clinic and how do we actually keep that workflow going? 
Um, for those that have done training with us before, I'm a really big fan of the next appointment. So if they come in, especially for the patients coming in for that over 75 health check or the 715 every nine months, over 75s every 12 months, we can definitely get that patient to rebook in that 12 months um, period because that's going to save us time in the background for our reminders um, and ring calls. So that next appointment, wherever you can work that in, actually works really, really well for patient engagement as well. One of the other, I guess, big questions that I always seem to get is, you know, um, especially, you know, I can do a care plan, but I haven't done a health check before um, or vice versa. I've done a health check, but I'm not really sure how to do a care plan. Um, my personal preference is to think about them as CDM activities. So for me, essentially, they're containing very similar information. So we just broke that down in a little um, summary of the care plan versus that health assessment. So we're always going to usually check the patient eligibility for the clinics that are doing that on PRODA or sometimes even just in your billing history, depending on the clinic. Um, we're going to have our little steps before we see the patient and then gathering that information um, from the nurse or health worker or if it's the GP doing it on their own. And then we're going to be putting that into a document. So essentially the information is the same. It's going to come down to you saw the different descriptions in each of those Medicare items. So it's just going to come down to that um, particular breakdown and um, if we need to tweak our little text shortcut. So um, I'll show you those in a sec when I get to that little demo. So big risk factors that we're going to be obviously looking at for a lot of chronic conditions um, will be age. It's very depressing, but unfortunately, once we get to a certain age, uh, we become at risk of pretty much every chronic condition. So um, age, gender, family history and ethnicity are our non-modifiable risk factors. And then what we're trying to recognise with a lot of patients as well are what are the things we can actually modify. So for those that have access to the SNAP guideline, I've got the link in the bottom as well for those that might not have seen it, but that's going to be looking at the smoking, nutrition, alcohol, physical activity. Um, and then the other one I've got there for modifiable will be weight as well. So I think this is a really good time to get planning, um, break down your data, have a look at the types of patients you may have um, that you might be looking at. And this time of year in particular, there's usually two times of year that I like to sit down and look at the adult in particular health assessments in those age groups, the 45 to 49, 40 to 49 heart health check and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander 715 because a lot of these patients are actually already thinking about their health in those age groups. So this time of year, I like to actually, um, it's what I call getting ready for bikini weather. So a lot of um, patients are actually going, oh, well, you know, winter's over, it's starting to get hot. Like it's a really good time to target that health and getting ready before Christmas. So a lot of patients really respond well um, to offers of health assessments in this time. And the other time of year that usually works really well is the just after Christmas. So I usually allocate a month to prep. So we're going to find our patients, get our things organised, like any resources we might need, set up our templates, appointment types, onboard the clinic um, staff to make sure everyone's on the same page. And then you book those patients in as they're kind of coming through. So whether you do letters, SMS campaigns, um, however you want to kind of target them in, um, but they're the two times of year that work really, really well. The other question I get is what observations to include. Um, so I've just got a little list there and basically it's going to come down to the patient's age and conditions. Um, same with the prevention and early detection. Um, as we said, in some of those non-modifiable risk factors, age, um, gender, ethnicity and family history are going to put patients at risk of a lot of other chronic conditions. So whether I'm doing care plan or a health assessment, it's all about identifying that risk and is there anything that we can actually um, do in that next 12 months because really it's a 12 month snapshot so you know if the patient's um, a smoker as an example over the age of 35 then we might look at doing the COPD screening if we're doing the heart health assessment we're going to look at maybe doing the um, everything that we need ready for the cardiovascular risk um, so it's just about putting that list together and then working through that over that next 12 months so usually even after a health assessment there's follow-up appointments that actually come with doing that health assessment like we would with a care plan. So most um, patients that we have in for a health assessment will actually book in for the week after to come back in for blood results or 
any other testing that we might be doing in the clinic. Some clinics will do testing on the same day as a health assessment, so things like ECGs, um, et cetera. Um, but I find it be easier sometimes to do the work and then get the patient back for some, some of the follow-up tests once we've actually put that plan together. So I'm just going to just go straight to BP quickly and just show you where we've got our autofills. So my process for care plans and health assessments and reviews are all pretty much the same. So I usually start by adding in the tech shortcut. So say today we're doing the 40 to 49 health check. I would add that tech shortcut in, take a couple of minutes before I call the patient in from the waiting room. And then when we decide on which template we want to use, um, some clinics are accessing the health assessment here. This only works for a certain number of age groups. So the over 75, 45 to 49 or Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in that particular health assessment. Um, some clinics are preferring to use a letter template and sometimes they have multiple templates set up. So this is down to clinic preference of what you want to do in that space. But basically once we've filled everything out, the template generation should be very, very easy as in the last bit that we're doing. Um, and so I'm just going to show you ours so you can have a quick look. So we insert the history. I've just done a custom field and um, I just like to be able to pick from the drop down which health assessment we're actually doing. So I prefer that just one template makes it really easy for us to just do what we need to do. And then our progress note pulls across. So it's just going to come down to personal preference. That's just an, an idea. Fix up what we need to. The GP will do their component um, at the bottom of that as well. So it's just going to be down to your, your personal preference. So what we've done, I've added in some little quick steps. So um, you can actually run through those little quick steps yourself um, when you get a chance. Uh, but basically that's it. To open, progress note shortcut, run through everything that we need to, create that list of things we're doing in the next 12 months, um, and then open that draft, save the draft ready for review. So I've got a couple of case studies there. I'm just very aware of time as well. So I'm just going to start with the case studies. Um, or do you want me to I'll do this first case study and then we might go to questions if there's questions and then if there's time for the other two case studies, we'll do them as well. Thanks, Jan. We've got about nine questions, but oh, okay, it's important. So. Yeah. So, okay. So first case study, I've got Stuart. So he's a 42-year-old man that comes into the practice for some wound care. He's a smoker, overweight, on medication for hypertension, no care plan, no health check. So I guess, especially if I'm doing something like treatment room or if I'm working in an Aboriginal medical service and we're screening patients before the GP, I want to just have a quick look at the patient record before I call them in. So I want to know where they're up to with their billing. Um, so that's my preference. A lot of the clinics we work with, we actually have the eligibility checked the day before. Um, so then it makes the clinical team's job a little bit easier. So if I can see that my patient is actually eligible for um a health check or eligible for a care plan, I can actually see that really, really quickly um, while I'm with them. So as I said, the engagement side of the health assessments and care plans and chronic disease management, uh, they're more likely to book an appointment, they're more likely to turn up for that appointment if we get it done on the day. So I know it's an extra minute to what we're already doing, um, but for me, I'm looking at that long-term um, approach with our patients. So. Um, I will have a quick look at the record to see where they're at, but you can see in this case study, no health assessment, no care plan. So what is it that we're actually going to do with this patient today? Um, I guess for me, we're always going to do what they've come in for, aren't we? So they've come in for the wound care, so we're going to do that. If you do have time, you may do something else, like a set of bobs, obviously, or something like that, because they've got blood pressure or um, something like that. But depending on how long you have that appointment booked for wound care, there's a good chance you might not have anything to time to do anything else besides the wound and I think for me once I recognized that I didn't have to do everything on the one day chronic disease management actually became quite fun for me to do um, so I think we need to take that pressure off as well that yes if I've only got 10 minutes and they're in for wound care yes I recognize that this patient may need lots and lots of things done but the best thing I can do is recognize maybe one of the bigger appointments like a care plan or a health assessment that I can get them back for 
So I've just put in my little list that we would do the wound care. You may get time to do something like the OzRisk and flag that as something that we might do um, as a follow-up appointment. But for me, it's going to be the wound and getting the patient engaged enough to either come back in for a health assessment or a care plan. He's already got asthma, so we could actually go, um, or hypertension, sorry, on this one. Um, so he won't qualify for the care plan as it is. It's more going to be for the health assessment for, for the 40 to 49. Um, but look at everything that we need to do in that list. There's no way we can do that in one day. So I think once we get our heads around that component, um, so we've got a whole heap of those screening tools. So at risk of cardiovascular, COPD screening um, as a um, smoker, overweight, so ticks the boxes for a couple of other chronic conditions. So cardiovascular, diabetes and um, CKD as a couple of examples. The next case study I've got is Kevin. So 74 year old that's come in for some scripts. So it might even just be a blood pressure check with the nurse that we're actually doing um, as that before the GP appointment. So cardiovascular, eight medications, no care plan, no health check. So is Kevin eligible for a health check today? Technically, yes. This is where I would maybe think about the long-term plan. So I'd look at a couple of things. So would I necessarily do um, one of the other health assessments or would I look at it from the big plan? So for me, any of the 74-year-olds, if you've ever got nothing to do, run a report of your 74-year-olds and get them booked in around their birthday. <laughs> um so for me, I would look at it from that point of view. I'd probably do um, the blood pressure and um, they'd get their scripts from the GP. The GP might obviously order something else um, that might need to be done. But technically, this patient's going to need two appointments, one for the care plan, one for the health assessment. Because that list, we stopped typing when we ran out of room in the table. But obviously, there's going to be a lot of things that that patient might need from a referral point of view. And it might be some of those uh, paper-based uh, referrals that we need to complete. And then the third case study that I've got is Stacy, so 45-year-old that's in for a flu shot, Indigenous, ex-smoker, um, on medication for blood pressure and cholesterol medication, last 715, 12 months ago. So what health assessment is Stacy eligible for? Um, and then how often can she have that assessment done? So for me, the this patient's actually at risk because of age, ethnicity, and a lot of the other risk factors like ex-smoker, et cetera. So there's actually going to be a lot of follow-up to do from that 715 once we get that done. So same thing today, it might only be the flu shot. It might be an opportunistic 715, depending on the kind of setting that we're working in. But most of the time, it might just be for the flu shot, but recognising that they're due back for a 715. So getting them booked in. And then the next 12 month list, it's a whole lot of screening activities, isn't it? Just based on the risk. Um, so you can see down the bottom, we've got CKD, cardiovascular, OSRI, COPD screening, et cetera. But that's pretty much our big to-do list. And some of those are going to be really quick. So we might just organise a follow-up appointment and get a couple of those things done um, all in the one go. So I guess from a top tips, it's just to prepare, get everything ready um, and just pick a focus. Like it doesn't have to be you're working on every single type of health assessment in the one go. Look at your data and just break it down um, and then plan it in the background. So as I said, I like those two times of years, just getting ready for Christmas and then just after Christmas. I found they work really well. Um, you might have different patient populations. So um, it's really good to look at the data first. Order any resources. There's so many free resources that you can get into the clinic. Um, especially around lifestyle, um, so uh, nutrition, uh, physical activity, it's great to have some resources because that's going to be a, a connecting thing with our chronic condition patients as well. Getting your templates ready and any tech shortcuts. I know I've gone over my time. That's kind of the last one from me, Nicole. And I've got the references that will be kind of sent at the end of that as well, but we've got some time for some questions. Okay, Jane, there's a, a few questions, and I'm assuming yeah. this one refers to the OzDisc tool. Can yeah. it only be used for those at risk of diabetes or other chronic disease now? In the olden days, it used to be for anyone in this age group. 
Technically, it's to assess their risk for diabetes. So it's actually giving us a score for their diabetes risk. So it's specifically for diabetes. But mm -hmm. I find if we do this risk tool, then they're also at risk for a couple of other conditions. So it usually if we do this one and they're at risk of diabetes, then we're flagging them for other risk tools like the cardiovascular risk. While we're on that, I'll just, for those that, I've got the link in the slides for the updated cardiovascular risk calculator for those that haven't had a chance to have a look. Um, it's pretty exciting. There's um, a couple of extra fields for those that might not have seen this one yet. So I do recommend having a look. Um, I know there is software that does have it in there, um, like BP, et cetera, but this is the updated cardiovascular risk one. So definitely worth having a look. They've expanded the age group. They've added um, the clinically determined high risk, which is really interesting as well. Um, and then they've got history of AF, which is different to the other one, the use of the CVD medicines. Um, I think the other question used to say if they're on a blood pressure um, medication. And then postcode, which was a new one as well. And that's down to the socioeconomic indexes. So it's really good to have a little play around with that. I think it's a good opportunity, same thing, to just show the patient where they're sitting with that risk. So um, I hope that answers the question. Okay. Next question, for those with chronic disease and type 2 diabetes, 40, yeah. 40 to 49 years old, how often is the health assessment, health assessment being assessed? So if they've already got diabetes, um, so the, our options, I'll just bring up the little flow chart. So if they identify as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, then we could still go down that 715 every nine months. And obviously that's to keep addressing their current risk. So their risk for other conditions, how can we modify behaviours, et cetera. So that's an option. Um, if they can't do this one uh, because they've already got diabetes, then you'd be looking at what was the age or they're just in between that 40 to 49. Okay. Yeah. What, so I'd just be looking. Sorry. Yeah. I'd just be looking at their particular age. So obviously I'd go if they identify for a 715 first. If they don't, can we do one of the other time based assessments? And if not, we'll always go down to our heart health check then. Okay. Yeah. This is probably a similar question. What MBS can you bill if they don't rate highly enough to be at risk of diabetes? Yeah. So if they don't meet the criteria for the time based, so obviously we'll start up at the top. So if they don't identify as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and then you're looking that, you know, they could have one of these. If they don't meet the criteria for one of these ones, then this is where we're going to try and work in that heart health check. Because ideally we should just be able to go back and forth between these two. If the patient doesn't identify as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, we're going to hopefully start targeting patients a lot younger. So we really need to, for me, this is the age group we need to focus on because when they come in for their 30, like if they're, we're targeting the 30-year-olds to come in, we're going to do this health assessment today and then we're going to say, okay, we're going to see you in 12 months for your next health assessment. This is the age group that needs engaging um, because we're going to go all the way up until they turn 40 and then hopefully they won't be at risk of diabetes by then, which we'll keep doing the heart health check. So it's just a way for us to kind of, address that prevention and early detection, I think, if we can get them younger. So you're basically just going to see every single patient where they fit in that criteria. So if they don't meet the criteria for the time base, we'll try for one of the other assessments. And this one I can assume is the 715. Sorry, yeah. missed what you said about the nine-month mark. Oh, so the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health checks are every nine months. Um, it has changed a few times over the years um, it used to be not more than once every 12 months and then it's down to uh, every nine months now. So with the child assessment in particular, um, we usually do the first 715 with the six-week immu uh, six immunisations um, to start that off at the kind of six-week mark and then we do the next one with the 12-month immunisation. So we're even looking at that even at the younger age group to do those health checks. But yeah, every age group in the um, 715 is every nine months. Okay. Do you use the intellectual disability form for somebody with an ABI? Intellectual disability form for someone with a what? ABI? ABI acquired brain. Oh, acquired brain injury. 
um, it needs to meet the criteria um, of the intellectual disability. So I'll send through the link of that list. I'll just add it to my little list to send through. I'm pretty sure you can click in from the Medicare description as well, but I'll double check. If not, I'll send a separate link that you can add. I'll add it into the sources. Okay. Are you supposed to record additional information, not just yes or no? I like to, just because we're, we're really telling a story. I think for me, the text shortcuts really help me to just um, put the extra bits that I need to and yet still have that engaging appointment with the, the patient and making sure I don't forget to ask something. So for me, it's a little prompt. So, you know, it might be something like they qualify for a home medicine review in that medication one or, you know, they've never had a blood test before or they're overdue for their blood. So it's just a prompt to help us figure out what needs to happen in the next 12 months. So is it something around the prevention and early detection? Um, do I need the GP to kind of do a new referral or things like that? So it's just so we've got a story. Um, I like it in the text, uh, the, the progress notes, because a lot of people are more likely to go back into the text shortcuts into the previous progress notes than they are to actually open up the full health assessment um, template as well and go back and see what you did. So I do find it helpful to tell that story in the progress notes and then pull it across to the template. Okay. Do independent retirement village patients qualify for the 707? Independent. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So they're not actually in, they're not a resident in the aged care facility, even, yeah, either way. So they'd still. Yep. And I think these two questions are the same. Can you do a health assessment and a heart health assessment at the same appointment? No. So Medicare, the reason we kind of put that flow chart together um, was mainly because, um, so I'll give an example. When the heart health check first came out, um, there was a lot of Aboriginal medical services that were doing this as health promotion. So they were getting patients in, they were doing the, the 699 um, as part of that heart health check. And then they were going to do their 715 because the last 715s were, were it was due. Um, and then a lot of rejection, a lot of rejections were coming through. So they updated the explanatory note. So it, it will actually say you'll get the rejection code back saying um, they've already maximum number of services, I think is what it comes back on in the rejection. So I try and keep it in my head as not more than one mm -hmm. health assessment in a 12 month period, if you think about it like that. But um, so yeah, we're usually just matching the category. So I usually just start with the, the category first and then um, we we go from there. But yeah, if you think if about it patient, like you, sorry. yeah. No, that's if a okay. patient already has a history of all sorts of heart disease, can you still yeah. do the heart health check? Yeah, they remove the explanatory notes from the particular item number, but in there it still technically would meet that criteria. So for the follow-up appointments that you've talked about, about the health post-health checks, are you booking them in with a GP or back in with a nurse? And then if a nurse, what sort of billing do we justify our time against? Yeah. So in that list of things that we usually um, may be following up with the patient. So if I just bring up that slide, I'll just go back. So even this patient as the example, say we did the 715 today. Um, as part of that adult 715, the GP will order bloods. We'll automatically get an appointment booked in the week um, and usually allocate nurse time if they do things like their ECG or it might be the spirometry or we're going to just knock off a couple of those other screening tools or activities that might be done. So they're reimbursed by those particular item numbers. So if you're doing ECG, spiro, et cetera, it'll kind of come under that um, those particular items for the screening activities. One of our nurses, doctors, does the 721-723 and the 705-75 plus health or the 721-73 and 45-49-705. to 49, 705. Is this allowable? Technically, yes. So it, you can actually bill multiple item numbers on the day. Um, it's going to come down to, do you want to? 
<laughs> um, as in there's a lot of paperwork, there's a lot of Medicare requirements to do it. So I have worked in clinics where we do the health assessment and care plan on the same day. So an example would be in a lot of the Aboriginal medical services that I've worked in as a nurse because it's um, sometimes opportunistic um, to be doing them at the same time. Um, some GPs do prefer it that way. It's going to come down to the, the practice's um, preference and GP's preference on that. But my preference from a paperwork point of view, I'd rather get them engaged because a lot of clinics that sometimes might be doing those multiple numbers together, they might not get them back for the review. So I'd rather engage the patient in that initial appointment and go, look, let's get your care plan done for your whatever it is, and then we'll get you done for um, your health assessment or vice versa. Um, the other example I usually see is when it's uh, maybe the over 75-year-old patients and they're going, but didn't I have that done last week or something like that? So, so there are clinics that might do the over 75 together with the health check, but a lot of clinics and bumps prefer to just line up those over 75 with the driver's medical and get them done that way and then do the care plan separately. My preference is separate if I can. Health assessments and GPMP overlap a lot. How do you decide which to do? And this is a nurse new to general practice. So the health assessments and the care plans overlap? Overlap a lot. Yeah. So how do you decide what to do? Yeah. So uh, it is it is tricky. Um, depending, so if they don't identify as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander and the patient needs access to allied health, then the only way I can do that is by getting my care plan in place. So it's different in different settings. So in an Aboriginal medical service, the flow of patient care usually starts because it's from birth is the 715 health check and they have that um, availability of access to allied health to hopefully prevent um, chronic conditions. If the patient doesn't identify as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, the only option we have um, to access allied health under the Medicare subsidies is by doing that care plan once they have a condition in place. So it's the, I would just make that call with the GP depending on that patient's particular needs. So if they do have a condition but they're due for a health check and they want to do them as separate appointments, if they need allied health access, I'd probably start there and then do the health assessment to look at maybe the other risk factors um, and other things that might need to be implemented as part of that. I know we're sending out a recording and the slides um, to everyone that's registered, but do you, do your can we get Jane's autofills with the slides? Oh, they're usually only available in our online portal. So um, we do have availability, like in the online portal. You especially if you're looking at doing the health assessments from the whole thing, we've got the templates and the text shortcuts in our um, autofills there. The only other way to get those is actually to come to the face-to-face -face workshops, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, everything's in there um, in the online portal. So I'm happy to send a link for that as well. Thanks, Jane. Thank you. If a patient is diagnosed with CVD, how long is the wait for the next heart health check? Technically, it can be done every 12 months, that heart health check. It's just going to come down to the GP's preference. But obviously, in that flow chart, it's going to depend on where they're sitting in that. So if they're of an age where they might meet, I'd still just work your way through, it's going to come down to the individual patient. I'd still work my way through this. So even if I did, I'm just going to clear, <laughs> got highlighter everywhere. Um, say we did the heart health check today and this patient was 44 as an example. Um, I would see if next year, when I'm getting them to book in today, we could actually book them in for the 45 to 49 because financially for the clinic, depending on the item number, that's up to $300. The 699 is sitting under $100. So financially for the clinic, if we can do a time base, you saw from what we're looking at, we're still looking at the same things. We're still looking at risk factors. I would prefer to obviously get the revenue, but also get the patient benefits um, from the particular health assessment. So, um, yeah, it's going to come down to every single time you do a health check, just go back through that flow chart to make sure you get the financial um, maximum that you can because you're doing that. The health assessments are very similar, so you're doing the same thing. You just want to make sure you're getting the right number. Can you 
do an ankle break heel index during a, during a 75 plus health assessment for everyone or just people at high risk? How do you decide what other test examinations to complete? This is a conversation to have um, as part of that setup and planning process in the clinic. The ABIs, I just want to read one thing. I think it says it in the 707 while we're just chatting. Um, I think it might say it as part of the 699. In some of the little Medicare descriptors, some clinics won't be billing them on the same day. They usually bill those in the follow-up appointments where they're kind of getting everything together. But as to decide as who needs to have those screenings done, it's good to just sit down with the GPs and go, look, this is the equipment we have. We have the ABI, we have the ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. Oh, it's in the ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. That's what it is. Um, six oh seven. Um and just get them to give you a bit of a patient demographic and just say, look, we want to do it on these patients that are, you know, ex-smoker, current smokers. They'll kind of put a list together. So you've got your own um, little list to follow because it does change from clinic to clinic. Um, I'll show you this little description just from Medicare. So the ABI doesn't have the explanatory note It looks like Jane may have frozen and dropped out. Um, so we might wait maybe a minute to see if she's able to, a moment, sorry, if she's just able to jump back on. Yeah, I've just got a couple of people have lost audio as well. Uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you all for your patience. I do understand this session has run over, but seems to be a lot of really valuable information coming from this. Yeah. Um, again, you're more than welcome to continue popping questions into the Q&A box. We were nearly done. We just had one more question to go oh. on for Jane. I hope she's okay. And um, I will be repeating this again, but uh, all the information that you've seen today uh, will be provided in a post-event resource email that will be sent through to you within the next couple of days. Uh, and that'll also include other relevant resources and also a link to the recording. Mm -hmm. Now, if Jane doesn't come back, I do have the last question and I've got a, um, a participant's name with that. So I can Fabulous. get that question answered for you. Um, Fabulous. Nine. If she doesn't, if she's unable to jump back on the next 30 seconds, I might just close the session and get as many. So if you want to pop down some questions into the Q&A box, we can get them answered for you. Power just went out. She's trying to get back on. Okay. Well, I might share my screen and uh, 
say my closing comments. And if Jane happens to jump back in, then I will stop sharing. Um, but I would like to thank everyone for being a part of today's session. It has been an absolute pleasure to have you here this afternoon, and I hope you have taken away some valuable insights. I'd also like to ex extend a special thank you to our exceptional presenter for her fabulous work. So that we can further improve these education workshops, please take a moment to fill in the event survey. You can do so now by scanning the QR code on your screen. At the end of the session, the survey link will also appear on your screen. Your responses are greatly appreciated and highly valued. Please also take a moment to check out other upcoming MFIN education events by scanning the middle QR code on your screen. It will take you directly to our MFIN uh, events website uh, where you'll be able to find out more information about what other education workshops we have coming up or to register yourself for one. There will be a follow-up email that everyone will receive, which will include a copy of the presentation you've seen today, in addition to other relevant resources and a video link. You will also receive your certificate of attendance within the next week of this session from MVM. If you have missed the first webinar on health assessments, a quality improvement activity that was hosted on the 17th of August, you can scan the third QR code uh, on your screen to be directed to the recording. Uh, a link to this webinar will also be included in the follow-up email. Now, Julie, do you think we should, we've yeah. given enough time? She just messaged me to say that her power had gone off and she oh. was trying to get back in on her phone, but it doesn't look like it's working. So I'm really sorry, everybody, but we will make sure all the questions get answered. And as Nicole said, you'll get a copy of this presentation. So thank you all for joining. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. Bye-bye.